uh, where uh, they expect also to set targets to member states, including in the field of sovereignty. And we, we see that acceleration into uh, centering sovereignty again, probably because of realization of uh, risk of data losses or threats, uh, including um, data transfers to the US after Schrems II uh, case. But also the pandemic has kind of exacerbated the kind of risk of outages, especially of critical infrastructures in, in Europe and elsewhere. But also I think the increased kind of awareness, including among people about our dependency to, to big tech and to big tech services and infrastructures, whether in our schools, university, our health system and, and others. So I'm really um, happy to dive into that discussion and, and really understand where are where is the consideration for our human rights in this debate and how both the dependency on big tech, but also solutions that are centering uh, sovereignties affect uh, all of us and especially people at the margins. So I want to welcome uh, Seda Gerses, who is uh, Associated Professor at the Faculty of Tech Policy and Management at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. Welcome. Uh, Estelle Massé, who is Legislative Manager and Global Data Protection Lead at Access Now. Welcome, Estelle. And Frank Karliszczak, who is the founder and the CEO of Nextcloud. Welcome. And I wanted to start this discussion with the, the same question, in a, if you can answer briefly, of course, I understand that is a, a very vast topic, um, to understand what is your definition of, of digital and technological sovereignty and what do you think it should be? I'll start with Estelle. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and congrats to Adriana. On another great uh, privacy camp. Um, so I'll, this conversation, I think, is really about power. And the definition to me, uh, I think there could be two on what I think different actor means by it and what it should mean or it could mean um, for, for us and for, and for people who are uh, at the moment not representing in this conversation. The, what I mean by, by power is that it's a result of a, a power dynamic and a power struggle, mostly between private actors and government, where governments are realizing, as you mentioned, Claire, that we're slowly losing control over critical infrastructure, over infrastructure in general. And there is this sort of um, pushback and callback of government trying to regain that control. And this is where the, the word sovereignty comes into place in order to regain some, some degree of autonomy and don't have to depend on those private actors when you want to develop COVID tracing apps, for instance, when you want to develop health system, when you want to develop school automated system, things like that. Um, but the point that is missing in those conversations at the moment is what is the sovereignty component for for internet users, for app users, and for people in general. Um, it's, it's a power dynamic between two actors um, that are supposed to be serving a third one that is not representing those conversations and it is, um, which role is not interpreted there. And so when we're having conversation about digital sovereignty, we should actually have a conversation about digital checks and balances and what elements of, of uh, control we can put back for the users that are supposed to be served by um, the public and private services. At its core. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, framing discussion in terms of power. Uh, Frank, what is your definition? Uh, it's really hard to say this in just a few, uh, few words. Um, it's really about um, being in control of your digital destiny, your digital life. Um, the interesting thing about digital sovereignty is that it's a term that is a meaning from a, from a government perspective. A government should be sovereign, but also for individuals. Um, because also like people uh, should be in control of their, of their digital life, basically. Um, and as uh, Estelle already said, the interesting thing is that private actors like big tech is um, is in control at the moment as a de facto I mean not legally but as de facto they are in they're controlling the digital destiny of um, yeah most of the world um, 
and that's something that's not healthy um, on many aspects from an individual perspective, privacy, but also from an economic perspective. It's just not such a huge concentration of power is not just not healthy for the planet. Um, and I think digital sovereignty is a term that um, for me means that people should be in control of their life more government smaller companies individuals and not be de facto or controlled by uh, big IT companies um, else, especially if they're not even um, respecting um, local legislation legislation because they're just based in another part of the world um, so that's what it means for me Thank you. Um, Seda. Great. So um, thanks, Claire, for um, having us here and congratulations on the Privacy Camp 10th edition. Super exciting. Um, I just want to take a little bit of a historical view um, on both computing itself and in terms of digital sovereignty. Um, I'd like to invite you to think about computing as a post-World War II control technology. So it's great that the term control came up in both uh, Estelle and Frank's introduction, uh, but I would like to think about computing as a technology of control um, that we have now uh, been able to expand to the point that we can apply it to all the things. To open up that some more, um, in the mid, mid of the middle of the 20th century, powerful political um, and economic forces, um, especially post World War II, gave rise to computing. Computers were a technological innovation of control and, to be more specific, operational control. It was informed by World War II management of military. The technology was um, also informed by deep distrust in humans following the use of the nuclear bomb and many other atrocities of World War II and the desire to build control technologies that had had at least two driving forces. They were aimed at removing the autonomy of individuals, something that manifests itself in designs that implement distributed trust, and to build control systems that could bring powerful opponents of the Cold War to their knees. In this history, we see the first instances of a battle for digital sovereignty, um, thanks to some great historical work by Ksenia Tatarchenko, um, we know that in 1966, Charles de Gaulle downgraded France's membership in NATO, uh, which I guess is a military alliance, as many of you know. Um, this semi-departure from NATO had to do with the unfulfilled desire of France to integrate its own nuclear deterrence into the alliance. Three months after, the de Gaulle struck um, an agreement with the Soviets to do research on computer science. Um, and in general, the reason the goal was taking these actions was because they wanted to challenge American domination of the computing market and specifically the French computer mar computing mar market. As part of this program, the goal also nationalized a Belgian Norwegian computer company called Bull and founded the Institut National de Recherche en Informatique et Automatique, IMRIA. This is kind of maybe the first digital sovereignty move, even though it wasn't called that at the time. However, over the decades, developments in computing became more commercialized. What was originally a military technology was enhanced and further developed through what I will shorthand as the business of computing. Moving from mainframes to personal computers to web-based services, the business of computing has given to us what we today consider computational infrastructures. The cloud infrastructures that we have with mobile devices as its accessories, with decreasing autonomy for the individuals because that mobile devices are controlled through the clouds and there's practically no software production outside of these computational infrastructures, which I know Frank is an alternative to, so we'll come back to that. These computational infrastructures have become so powerful that it's close to um, at impossible to produce software and distribute compute independent of them. And most of the hardware production that we have today, including microprocessors to networking devices, are optimized for their market-driven needs. This is significant. As I said earlier, powerful political, economic, and social forces gave rise to these computational infrastructures with great capabilities of control. What we see now is that these computational infrastructures have become so powerful that they have set free their own economic, political, and social forces. 
computational infrastructures that have come to threaten the forces that gave rise to them to begin with. For me, therefore, digital sovereignty represents the reflex of nation states forefronted by prominent figures of the Cold War era, grabbing back on known tricks like nationalism, uh, very apparent in the case of US, France, and Germany, market dominance, and claims to global power to respond to the transformations brought about by computational infrastructure. So it's an old bag of tricks applied to respond to, let's call it big tech. And what we've also seen in the last decade is that this response has been extended to include things like the use of open source technologies, data protection, et cetera, to make claims of digital sovereignty. So this is just a kind of political view. There's also an activist view, but let's come back to that in discussion. So let's just, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seda, for, for this historical perspective. It's, it's quite interesting to see how the, the concept evolved and how it, it found its, its sources also in nationalism. Um, so I'll, I'll continue with you. Um, you know, I, I like to understand like what you think are some of the most problematic aspects of our dominance on, on big tech and on dominant tech infrastructures and services. Um, what some of us have, have called like digital colonialism and how it affects like people at the margin. Um, also because to, to answer Frank's po point about taking back control, um, how can we, how can users be in control uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a world that is dominated that we, we know we have no choices and especially uh, the most vulnerable of us. So could you, could you dive into that a little? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it's um, I think there are some suggestions as to what we want or aim for um, from a more activist perspective in terms of digital sovereignty is individual control over our data. Um, I personally think that's a kind of misplaced understanding of um, the computational infrastructures we have. I think what we see is not only um, a dependency on somebody else's server, like the cloud, uh, but the fact that any mean, like the main means through which software reaches millions and billions of people has to go through the few tech companies and the kind of software production practices that they uh, push forward, like micro uh, microservices or agile development mechanisms and, and service architectures at all, um, overall to begin with. Um, and what I see these companies especially doing is trying to capture, they've kind of captured individuals in many ways, right? Like they're in our pockets, they can address us in many ways. I don't think they know anything about us, but they have an infrastructure that makes us addressable through their infrastructures, which gives a lot of companies and governments dependence on them to reach us, right? And so the other market, I think that they're now trying to go for through the cloud, especially, is institutions. So this is kind of what you referred to, Claire, in, in your opening talk, um, the way in which, you know, especially with COVID, we saw the acceleration of IT being replaced with cloud-based services. Um, these, this transformation, what, let's call it digital transformation, is not just the removal of IT and internal expertise of institutions, but a complete revamping of what it means to be an institution, both in terms of governance, economics, and dependency on technologies of others. So what I see, I can't explain it in great detail, is a kind of gutting out of basic institutions um, through scalable services that are dependent on the clouds that are driven by financial forces. I think that if you want to go back to your question on fundamental rights, I do believe that we need institutions to create societies in which individuals can be protected and can practice and exercise their fundamental rights. And if we lose these institutions, that it is impossible to, for us to exercise our, our um, fundamental rights. Now there's a problem. Institutions have historically, um, especially in Europe, failed to respond to the needs of underrepresented communities, racialized communities, or they have been actively part of racializing certain communities, especially immigrants. Um, so I think it is on the one hand very depressing that these organizations are being, especially public institutions, are being gutted out by big tech through the service architectures and cloud dependencies. Um, but at the same time, I do think this is a moment to reclaim those institutions, not just technologically, but also in their vision of serving exactly the communities that we're interested in and fundamental rights. Mm 
thank you so much uh, for for bringing back the, the discussion on like how do we do collective advocacy to to reclaim these institutions and and sometimes move away from the frames that we you know we have. Uh, Frank, uh, could you could you maybe explain also from a, from an insider perspective what some of the European companies but also technologists have done to increase our resilience or sovereignty, but also how did uh, Microsoft in particular, but also other uh, big tech companies have reacted to, to, to these uh, moves? Yeah, yeah happy to. Um, let me first go back to uh, your earlier questions um, because it's, I think it's important for the context. I think it's quite fascinating to um, to see what uh, big uh, big tech uh, companies, specifically Microsoft, are doing um, the last few years. So, as as mentioned already by Seda, um, Microsoft invented the software licensing business. Right, they invented the business of selling software licenses, and with this business model, became like the richest, biggest company in the world, like in the nineties. Um, and they had control over their customers because the software was proprietary, not open source. And they also controlled the file formats, um, like the Office document file formats. So this was basically their way to grab the power and to become the richest company in the world. Um, the file format war um, was going on like 20 years ago um, with, the, um, with the push by the EU to, um, to uh, create open file formats, basically. Um, but that was not a complete win, but there was some, some pushback. But it's really interesting because Microsoft decided that this power grab is not even big enough um, like 10 years ago. So they abandoned their own business model with selling software licenses, which they invented and became the biggest, most powerful company in the world. They abandoned this business model and said, okay, we do something even more powerful. We move completely to software as a service to cloud-based uh, computing. So now you know, don't even, of course, the software is still proprietary, the file formats are still a problem, but you don't even get the software anymore to install it where you want. You just use software as a service from the cloud, uh, which is then you can pay, and then you have access to your file, all the tools, your coworkers, or you stop paying, then you're out. So this is like, and there's no way to migrate it to somewhere else, by the way. Um, because they are not, I mean, maybe you can download the files, but there's no way to f export your chat history or your whatever, all your complicated structured data. And even if you could, there's no other application that can read like all these exports. So this is like the biggest power grab ever. Um, and another big uh, interesting aspect is how it works from a contract perspective. So the German government, for example, I have some insights there, is um, has as all, every big organization has um, contracts with Microsoft, but this were like contracts to get software licenses to be hosted internally as they want. And these contracts are basically transformed from software licenses, licensing contracts to cloud software as a service contracts. Right? And then basically the governments are forced basically to lose even more control to push into the cloud. And that's something that's a, that's obviously um, yeah, a big problem because there's no way out again. This is like the ultimate move. You can never get out of this contracts or this cloud um, um, situation anymore. This is why it's so important to really fight back. And there are lots of different levels where you can fight back. There is like, um, you have to fight back from a contract perspective. You really, and there's some initiatives going on in the governments that these contracts need to be revisited then um, it needs that needs to be open source self-hosted alternatives this is like the mission of nextcloud so we try to build like this alternative to microsoft 365 google workspace and so on but open source so you can look inside you can make sure there are no backdoors you can really um, see what's happening and that it's um, also hosted where you want. You can host the data internally, like the French government or the German government, there's infrastructure which is just internally not even connected to the internet. Right? This is not even possible with Google or Microsoft. This is, only works with open source software. So this is um, really key. And open source alternatives are also important, like for the poorer areas in the world, right? Not every kind, everybody can afford um, like a Microsoft subscription, right? If you're like a student, like in, in an underdeveloped region of the world, well, good luck um, buying a Microsoft subscription to get access to state-of-the-art software. 
So you really need, there needs to be um, open source alternatives. And um, yeah, that's something that is absolutely, absolutely key. And then um, I will stop <laughs> talking too much. Um, maybe later I can also talk a little bit about uh, the antitrust complaint, which is another angle that needs to, uh, needs, uh, needs to be used to fight Microsoft here. Thank you. Yes, um, I have I have more questions about also what can be done and how can maybe governments and institutions in Europe like promote alternatives and, and help that move. But I, I wanted to go to Estelle now and um, use the data protection framework to, you know, to, to, to question the concept of sovereignty. There's many aspects and it can be quite technical, but what I'm interested to know is, is from a, a data protection or a privacy perspective, uh, where data collection, processing and transfers are, are happening in a global world, does, does sovereignty even make sense? Um, also because the GDPR has uh, extraterritorial uh, impact. But um, if sovereignty is not the concept to center, what are then the principles in, in these cross-border uh, transfers, whether commercial or law enforcement uses? Thank you. Um, I think to answer this question, I need to continue uh, or build a little bit on what um, Seda has explained on the historical conversation around digital sovereignty, which was really fascinating. And um, I, I only looked at it from a, from a subcomponent of it, from the data sovereignty conversation. So I may I may be missing some point here. So I'd love to further connect with Seda on how to build the two, but. I, I started looking basically over the past few years on how the concept of data sovereignty popped up in Brussels conversation and where this was coming from, um, where this push was coming from. It really um, got a lot of um, a lot of um, wind in Brussels and started being picked up a lot when uh, Commissioner Bot on the French Commissioner um, arrived and starting putting those those discussion around data wars and data control and data sovereignty in Brussels. And so in, in starting looking a little bit, this came from a lot of conversation also in France around the same concept, sometime increased or around beyond data sovereignty to digital sovereignty on the fact that this assumption that the, the commissioner also has communicated about that Europe and France a lot of time had lost the quote unquote war on data to the US. And this is something that I personally push back a lot on um, because I think it's it's a wrong framing. I think Europe chose a really different path than the US one that was driven by uh, tech and private interests of harvesting data in Europe chose and tried to resist in more a protective framing, one that people would maintain a certain level of control. But all of this obviously fell through when you're in a scenario where there is um, those private actors don't only just define the role of the game, but also become the infrastructure and are able to push back against any legislation that government try to put forward to try to maintain a level of institution and a level of control for people. Just because even though they're technically supposed to be respecting our legislation, they just have de facto with the control they have over infrastructure so much power that they are able to influence those legislation just by the type of standards they may be pushing, the type of processes they may be put in place. And this creates this, this impression from, from state actors that they have lost the control, that the control is in the end of the US. And what I think they mean by the US here is a group of companies based in the US more than the US government, for instance, and a try to wanting to gain back this control. Sorry, this this war framing is existing, even though we're not technically in a conflict, but um, that we Europe has to fight back. And because the personal data war, control over personal data was lost toward those private actors, Europe should be gearing up and being prepared of winning what Commissioner Breton is referring to, the industrial data war. So having, this is where you see the push for uh, you know, sovereign clouds to be there for um, data acts to be there in order to try to maintain control over some type of data that should stay in Europe and be controlled by Europe. And a lot of the time here, privacy and data protection argument are being advanced and they are positive measure on those fronts. But really what Seda pointed to is that those are those points are being used as tools for the greater nationalistic perspective of like, 
we want this control. We as the state want the control here. And really, ultimately, the goal is not to give us or to give people more privacy or more personal control over um, over this information. And in this context, the the data conversation is only one aspect of the larger control grab, power grab that is happening between between state and private actors. Now, does this mean that there is no potential for more for positive changes uh, within those framing that we could be using to our advantage since, you know, privacy and data protection or other fundamental rights are being advanced by state actors as a sort of justification for those moves, even though they might not be the underlying rational to it. Um, I do think there is a an overall issue with the rational that means that we would always potentially be an outlier in it. And so there is a need to have a conversation of reframing this debate and also making understand the, the danger of a sovereignty uh, conversation um, when it's happening between the EU and the US, you know, to big Western countries and how other countries are picking up on it and using it to justify their abuse. There are data protection law and privacy law being promoted in Egypt, India and Russia, data protection measures that are actually hurting people and are being discussed over the term saying like it's about data sovereignty and they're just being used for you know, the Egyptian government to control what the population is doing, the Indian and Russian government to localize all the data within their borders so that their intelligence authority can look into it and control dissident and journalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So by allowing this framing to exist, it is being justified, being used by other countries and that leads to human rights, human rights abuse as well. So there are the danger of that framing in the first place, the danger of issue we're trying to defend being misused and used against us. And there is the losing the perspective of like, okay, you're fighting for a model. You're fighting to, you think, if we think about the EU perspective, you think you lost that war. Okay, fair enough. I disagree. I think we chose a different approach. That was a better approach and we should double down on the approach of that. And so you think you lose that part and your reaction is to be, okay, so now we will win the second battle by using the same strategy, even though we already know we lost the infrastructure and you kind of admit that we do Gaia X, but we still ask those actors that control everything to be the underlying infrastructure. How strategically do you think it's going to go for you? Like, how do you think you're going to win this battle? I think instead, the really the path for the EU is to double down on its approach. It's like, okay, let's be true about protecting human rights, protecting, protecting uh, freedom and values. And make sure that we give ourselves a mean to implement the privacy changes we want to do to implement open source, to implement open government and open data, which are being pushed by a lot of government, actually, as Frank mentioned, and are just not capitalized on it. And this means, you know, reviewing the way EU does investment and in, in put money in innovation. You know, we we put forward good legislation, but then we also give a lot of money for like surveillance at the borders everywhere, for surveillance tools to be developed, and that there's just not a line in policies there. We develop good legislation, but we don't do any effort in making sure they are enforced and delivered. And so if we're just being a bit logical and where we could want to do, we could be, we, we could open up a different path. I think the, the sovereignty discussion is just a lose-lose result for the government in the long run and for, for people in Europe, but also elsewhere on how this, this framing will be abused, specifically in the context of data. Now, I reckon that my... My vision on it may be a bit too narrow on data, and there is a larger, I think, uh, digital component of it with infrastructure that uh, Frank, Frank and Seda both um, really delve into. And I'm quite interested to see how all of them might might deal into places. But it's um, it's really it's really creating a lot of, I think, global issue also. And this is what fundamentally is blocking also some some of the cross border data issue that you you mentioned, Claire, on like the, the countries just fighting each other and none of them wanting to reform surveillance with the grail of like being sovereign and controlling, but who lose in this scenario, all of us being surveilled and tech companies, you know, continuing doing harvesting model because it served those sovereignty and justification. Thank you so much for that perspective, Estelle. Um, and you already hinted to some of the choices that, that we, we are facing, and I'll come back to that um, after the, the Q&A. But I wanted, you know, you also uh, name-dropped Gaia X, and I, I wanted to hear from Frank um, a little bit of the background or, or your perspective on, on how that is going, on kind of the original idea and how the project is, is evolving. And then in the while you were doing so, I'm also opening um, the chat for, for any questions to panelists. 
Yes, um, I'm happy to. Yeah, Gaia X is an interesting, interesting um, topic, um, and I'm only sharing here my personal opinion. Right? There are like lots of opinions about Gaia X out there. So um, I personally was involved since the very beginning. Um, it was in originally initiated by the German Gov uh, Ministry of Economics. Um, um, and was involved in some discussions uh, at the beginning before it even had its its name. Um, the idea was quite clear and, and bold, which is like Europe needs um, cloud infrastructure to co to be able to compete with China and the US. This was the was the original idea, very clear. I mean, like I don't know, elevate a pitch in one sentence. Um, then the discussion was, um, should this be done following the um, the Airbus model? Um, some of you might uh, remember, or maybe not that old, or know from the history books, how Airbus was founded. Um, it was um, um, Europe at the time realized that Europe needs an alternative to Boeing. Um, and it, um, Airbus was founded as one huge company um, with um, based in different countries, but one big company to build like an alternative to Boeing uh, in, in Europe. And then the question was, okay, should we do the same for cloud? Should there be a cloud Airbus? And then the decision was, it's a bad idea. And I agree with that. And instead, Gaia-X is supposed to be a, a federated system between all those mid-sized cloud companies in, uh, in Europe. It's basically a set of standards and APIs and open source implementations that connect all the medium, small, medium-sized cloud companies together and become like a virtual hyperscaler, basically. This was the original idea. Um, the idea, I think, was very good. Other uh, governments in Europe joined the initiatives, France first and then uh, several others. Um, and then it was announced and become quite big, at least in press, and hundreds of companies uh, joined this initiative. Um, and then unfortunately, a mistake was made, I think, in my opinion. Uh, it was allowed that the US cloud companies actually also joined Gaia-X. Um, there were a discussion um, if this is a good idea, because what well, the original mission was to have an alternative to them. How can there be a member now? Um, the, de the decision was that, OK, there can be a member, but I don't have any voting rights. Um, and that's that's okay. They cannot vote, but they are still in the working groups, and they do what they always do. They just like um, go in there and flood everything with endless discussions, endless papers, endless specifications, endless certifications, and um, yeah, Gaia X really lost its vision, from my opinion. Um, I'm sure they will produce some certification, some standard, something at some point. But I don't think it will really change the cloud ecosystem in Europe. Um, sorry, I'm a bit disillusioned there. It's, it's just the usual, usual tactics of, of big tech. Um, this, you can also destroy something from the inside, which I think is what's happening here. Thank you for that, Frank. And I think also it shows the, the limits of um, kind of the self-regulatory or the labeling certification kind of model. Um, so we have two questions. Uh, one is about whether uh, the digital infrastructure made of 100% fiber optics, uh, FTTH and Nextcloud everywhere and uh, would, would be a, a perfect frame. Um, and I'll leave the expert answering on that. Um, Frank, maybe, or others, would you, would you, would we have kind of an alternative to what a perfect infrastructure would look like? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, with all these discussions, I'm always have the opinion, gut feeling that we should not try to copy China or the US here, but find a European way. So the strength of Europe is that we are not centralized, that we have lots of different countries and languages and cultures and everything, diversity. It, for me, Europe is about diversity. And the solution for these tech problems also have to be, in, a, in my opinion, in a diverse way. So 
basically have an ecosystem, have an, an, uh, an economy of lots of small, medium-sized players that work together, they compete with each other, and they can um, innovate and um, and build up this infrastructure. And that's the same for the for the infrastructure with, with fiber and chip manufacturing and all the other basically low-level topics, but also on the more high level, like a software business, same what Nextcloud is doing. So I think this is something that we want. I don't think any initiative of like, I don't know, let's do one huge initiative, have one huge company, which like is, I don't know, build, is building everything up in, 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 in Europe as a single player, as it works in China, right? It's centralized controlled and the US is sometimes similar. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should be basically we believe in our European values and use those as a as a strength to um, yeah to build the future. Thank you. Uh, can I? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Frank. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, congratulations for next round twenty three that you have just released. That is a really great milestone. Uh, Super Boris. Um, um, so, uh, answering to Estelle about the digital uh, digital infrastructures, so I think that fiber optics, FTTH, everywhere in uh, all the houses, uh, public institutions, and uh, companies, is the best uh, uh, environment friendly technology to uh, the the transmit the data uh, that we have today. So it's the best that we we can have for uh, environmental uh, environmental topics like uh, electromagnetic uh, radiations, you, re you reduce electronic, uh, electromagnetic radiations that are not good for health, we know it. Um, and it's more secure also. So uh, having solutions such as Nextcloud for the cloud or Selfish OS for uh, mobile phones, uh, you can have uh, in Europe a superb uh, uh, digital infrastructure plus software, uh, hardware that is uh, open source, uh, certified, and working for your, uh, your control and uh, for the good. Okay, so this is, uh, we have the solutions. So uh, uh, also Li-Fi is interesting to uh, 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 transmit uh, data from uh, the light, okay, uh, with uh, 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 reduced effects uh, on the health. So because Wi-Fi is not neither something that is good for your health. So Li-Fi is better. It's Thank you, Rodolf, for, for explaining a little bit more <laughs> with, the, with the technical background what you mean. But I think also Frank is pointing to a more kind of healthy um, ecosystem and, and the possibility of having competition. And I think we've made some uh, progress in terms of interoperability uh, in some of the legislation. Um, I wanted to, to also pose a Jacqueline question about the impact of the future U.S. antitrust legislation on on some of the data protection, but also the platform regulations uh, legislation. And we know that Google and other big tech are heavily lobbying against the US uh, antitrust legislation. So anybody uh, will want to take that, perhaps Estelle? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, I think there is uh, quite a lot of interesting development happening um, in the US in particular from their regulatory bodies. Uh, the U.S. Congress is still quite inactive at the moment, even though interesting, you know, bills are being proposed on, on a lot on a range of issues. But like concrete action is still, um, we're still waiting for meaningful changes. So changes in push conversation being done by the Federal Trade Commission, by uh, several advocate general also in the U.S. in addressing mostly competition, but issues that covers a wide range of other issue like like privacy, like also the impact of specific technology on, on on different communities will be really important. And I think um, there is still a, a need to make sure that those conversations are not solely happening from a perspective of competition, that they're a bit more comprehensive. Um, but this is a bit the way things works in the US with the current model. There is a lot of sectoral protection, so a lot of the response might still be a little bit sectoral, but there is definitely a change of attitude happening from, from the regulatory bodies and a change also that was initiated in a lot of U.S. states, um, often linked to the lack of action by Congress, where you know uh, quite a number of um, individual states have passed um, pretty good privacy legislation, also legislation you know banning 
certain types of facial recognition, doing legislation on biometric, et cetera, et cetera. So the art movement in the U.S. is just we're missing a bit of more uh, action in, in Congress and where you can see obviously the, the impact on lobbying and the fact that um, a lot of companies are pushing back against action. But I think the the way the conversation has been involving in particular around the FTC uh, in in the public seeing of those the big tech company and the power they hold in the U.S. society is changing, which is something that even at the time of the Snowden revelation, you know, you would that was not still there yet. People were um, appalled by the abuse that happened mostly by by the public authority, by the NSA. But um, there was not at the time the really the conversation about like don't the company that actually do the initial collection also have too much power because of the collection that is happening, and so. Um, yeah, I, I do think we will uh, will be getting closer and closer in those conversations, but it still is quite disappointing, I have to say, that we are in 2022. Um, about more than 100 countries around the world have adopted really comprehensive legislation to protect privacy, um, and the U.S. is still a huge outlier on that. And honestly, we need to be looking at the lobby of big tech in preventing this from happening because... Privacy is a right in the U.S. Constitution towards the, um, at least towards the public authority. So why would people not have similar rights to rate private actors? Um, it's a little bit puzzling. Thank you, Estelle. And also plugging here um, the next, not the next, but this afternoon panel uh, discussing uh, the the U.S. and EU legislations like the Digital Services Act, but also the newly introduced bill. Um, on surveillance, on banning surveillance advertising in the U.S. and what what that could mean. Um, asking if Frank and Seda wanted to react to any of these points or questions. Otherwise, yeah, no. I mean, I think I could take a take a yeah. stab at like thinking about what is a healthy ecosystem. Um, and also kind of responding to the conversation with Rudolf and Frank. Um, so I think it really is not just about replicating the infrastructure, but also what are we going to do with this technology, with this technology? Like what is it aimed for? Um, I think it's important to remember that the cloud in the hands of big tech that we have right now is potentially an aberration in history, very much thanks to the 2008 financial crisis, right? With the meltdown of 2008, you know, we have very few people who have shitloads of money now and they took their money from housing markets and pushed them into tech. And then tech had to grow. And in that moment, they held on to the cloud. So the cloud is a growth strategy, right? And so the question is, what does it mean to replicate that growth stra strategy in Europe? Does that mean that the governments have to push for that growth strategy? And remember, I said the growth strategy is about capturing institutions and gutting them out, right? Or scaling them up in ways, and we'll come back to the effects of that in a moment. So is the idea that the European cloud does the same thing, tries to attract investor, investors, tries to push for growth in the process, gutting out institutions and giving individuals devices that are no longer personal devices in any way, but are controlled and managed, and building on a culture of software production that is absolutely dependent on, on that kind of mentality of you know, managing millions of people in a controlled environment in the interest of financial outcomes, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I really think there's a big question to be asked before we start building fiber optic whatever and a massive cloud infrastructure that is only possible because we have super rich people that pumped money into big tech, right? And what does it mean to use public funds to do that? I think that's a really hard and important question. And what are we going to do with that technology or that kind of computational power um, once we have it. And, and here I just want to put a parenthesis, the antitrust case does not question the computational power, it questions its concentration in the hands of a few. So it doesn't question the speedy production using agile methods, right? Like, um, and, and um, it just says it shouldn't be owned by a few. And I don't know if we just replicate its production in Europe, we're going to get something different. And again, about the healthy ecosystem, I think it's really good that we use that term. Um, we are dependent on a huge supply chain that has been mostly breaking down during COVID and extraction of materials that pass through massive violations of fundamental rights and massive form, forms of exploitation that keeps inequality in the world in place. So it's really easy to start thinking about just us consuming services and how can we make these services not so dependent on big tech. But again, we have two problems. 
the production and the supply chain is optimized towards big tech because of their capital, right? Like they have immense amounts of money they can buy and therefore determine the direction of technology. We see this in microprocessors. Big tech has betted on specialized compute, which pushes forward machine learning and blockchain. Chip companies are producing towards them, right? Like how are we going to change these supply chains both to be more equitable and to also um, respond to our technological needs in terms of another vision. And finally, with machine learning, what these companies are doing is you know, pushing for scaled up services. And you know, many people have talked about the environmental impact of machine learning because of its data intensive and compute intensive um, um, intrinsic properties. But we think very little about the fact of using machine learning to scale up farming, potentially also killing not just diversity in humans, but diversity in agriculture, which, you know, causes a bunch of serious issues like the rise of viruses that produce pandemics, right? Like, so I think there's like a lot of questions to be asked um, about what we want to do with this technology and what is our vision. Um, I don't know if sovereignty is the right word. Um, I know a bunch of activists have picked up the concept of technological sovereignty to think about these questions. But how do we make sure that these technologies are not just serving market interests in Europe or regional or national interests in Europe uh, while reproducing supply chains and extraction and exploitation, uh, but actually producing technologies of life? So I think that's kind of my vision of a healthy ecosystem. <laughs> Thank you for for that uh, note, and um, also quite curious to see, you know, how the how the growth strategy, not just of big tech but also of financial markets, like uh, growing to to Web three or promoting crypto and uh, NFTs, you know, how will that impact our capacity in Europe to react to that? We will also try to, you know jump on the wagon and, and, and follow that race or, you know, I think our, our discussions on the visions of, of technology on the planet, on people and democracy is quite important. So I wanted to actually give you the opportunity to close with that, right? In this complex geopolitical and economic uh, environment and context, what are the political choices that we face um, as, as European citizens, as activists, and also for our institutions. You touch upon some, like the funding and our infrastructure choices, uh, free and open software. Um, what are what is what is your take and recommendation? Um, maybe starting with Frank. Sure. Thanks a lot. Um, I mean, in most of the topics that already mentioned here. Um, there's one more thing which was only briefly mentioned is the antitrust case. Uh, I want to uh, um, put some light on that um, topic. But it's not the only one. There are lots of actions um, that are needed. But antitrust is something which I think governments were, and this is the case, and Europe are too weak, in my opinion. So it's clear that uh, we have a concentration of power um, in big tech and uh, um, there are serious antitrust um, violations happening. It's just uh, the governments are too slow and too weak and this needs to change. Uh, one example is the, um, the antitrust complaint that we from Next, micro, uh, from Nextcloud submitted against Microsoft uh, lately end of last year. Well, we submitted a year ago, but end of last year we uh, went public with that. Um, which is about like using one monopoly position to gain an advantage in, the, in another one. Um, it's uh, it's um, it's clear. It's also um, communicated by the European Union that Microsoft has a monopoly on the operating system, on the desktop PC operating system market, and they use that to gain um, control um, to become the leader in another area, which is cloud collaboration um, space. They're bundling uh, OneDrive directly into Windows. Windows 11 now has Teams button directly in the taskbar. There are lots and lots of integrations. So they're basically using um, one power position to get into the next one, the next one, the next one. This is like this is like uh, monopoly behavior. Behavior. And this needs to be. Um, this needs to be that by by governments. I really wish um, governments would like um, use their power and um, follow their responsibilities to go against this behavior. 
Thank you, um, Esther. Um, I would plus one the um, the proposal made by Seda of reclaiming our institution. I think, in large sense of institution, this should be what drives our our approach in Europe, our strategy of making sure social institutions remain at the service of people, for people, and thought in a way that they serve them the best. And and to do that, this is where I add my my own component to it: is that I do think Europe is still good at understanding some of the challenges and the issue and how people are being impacted by by certain ecosystem at the moment and the way they don't necessarily function and so even though in in narrative and some framing um we may be uh we may be falling in the trap of trying to follow other instead of doing our own path but we're still putting forward legislations and changes that can be quite promising um but we usually fall through completely on how to enforce them. And this is where also we need to acknowledge the, you know, there is a lot of conversation in Brussels about the, the lobby power of big tech around legislation being adopted. This lobby power doesn't stop when the law is adopted. You know, this is one of the reasons why there are so many difficulties also in implementing GDPR. A lot of cases are being appealed for years on procedure grounds on everything you can throw because they have the means, those companies have the means to just make cases going on and on and on and drag forever. And so we don't feel the reality of those legislative and good political changes. And so it's to give a message maybe for the EU of like, at some point we'll have to stop creating new laws. We will have good structure, but we'll have to put all of the energies on making them a reality and enforcing them. And so that's why the action also of many EDU members like now and others on making those legislation a reality will be so important and just a cautionary tale for us to know that you know lobbying exists at all of those levels and making making a legislation is in, in fact just one step even though that step sometimes takes five to seven years but um the it's really part i think of the reclaiming the institution and making sure um the the progress um are delivered in a way that can serve people the best way thank you for that reminder and for championing gdpr enforcement uh, together with our other edu members um say that what is what is your ending note on our political and social choices yeah um i think there's kind of like a double strategy i think we have to tackle the the, the dominance of big tech um and and also think about other practices at the same time um, including in the way we reclaim institutions. So I just put a quote from the Technological Sovereignty um, Project that was pulled together by a bunch of people also at Calafu and activists um, who are doing some work also, for example, on 5G right now in Amsterdam. And, you know, like people are just trying to think of different ways of doing technology. And I think doing that different way of technology is really thinking hard from the problems that we're facing today and thinking about technology that addresses those instead of perpetuates big techs, um, technological practices, but in a European context. Um, so I think that, you know, we see this in, you know, Moxie Marlin Spike, um, who's, you know, one of the main developers of Signal wrote a web 3.0 post. And he's like, this is going to be the alternative, but we're going to make it agile and microservices and going to update new features all the time. And you're like, okay, you're so confused. We can't help you. Um, so I think, um, you know, Frank's initiative here in Nextcloud is kind of interesting. Um, in terms of institutions and organizations at least taking a pause before they ch jump into um, you know, the cloud infrastructures and mobile uh, devices as their accessories. I think that kind of daily practice is really important, but we can't just be like, we used open source, therefore we're fine. Um, and I know it's very difficult to even get that going, but we need to have a vision as to what is the future life form we want to have. Um, and I think the, the little quote I have from the technological sovereignty uh, initiative um, is very interesting. It says, if our desire is to bring about social change towards a more sustainable, collective and communal, communal society, we must change the means, the resources and the relationships that currently sustain society based on economic interests. And I hope we can go in that direction um, in the future. Thanks. Oh, and thanks for BBB. That's also part of the strategy. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, and thanks for, for reminding us uh, some of the more kind of structural changes we need um, and how fast uh, things are going and, and how difficult it is even to, you know, catch up 
uh, when when it seems like the growth is, is just um, having new frontier every day. And also um, plugging here another discussion that I think Estelle's colleagues and Amnesty and Fight for the Future are having. It's a little late on the European side, uh, but they're having a conversation more on the human rights implication of Web3. Um, and, and I'm sure that we will continue these discussions on this side of the Atlantic too. Um, there's been a, a few other interesting points about the role of Apple and other big tech companies, but I think um, unless there are any other burning statements from the panelists or questions, we will uh, close here with this vision for, for Europe and um, I will want to really thank uh, Estelle, Frank and Seda for this interesting and vast conversation. Um, thank you all for attending and um, and uh, looking forward to other privacy camp discussions um, and also other very interesting topics. Thank you so much. And um, see you and discussing, continuing these discussions very soon.